Hello and welcome to the Ferg Neil Show podcast. Can you be racist to white people? That is a sentence I prayed I would not have to begin a podcast with because this is a dangerous pod, highly dangerous pod. Could be the last pod. Could be the last <laughs> ever pod because Australian soccer captain, the Matildas captain, Sam Kerr, is facing six months jail for allegedly calling a British cop an old white bastard. And the old white bastards, may I say, were furious. I think the old white bastards were the only ones who were offended. The young white bastards and the median age white bastards weren't really offended. But the old white bastards, the the Bandrew Bolts, of the world were furious. They were livid. It's interesting, this culture war, because the conservatives are like, the progressives are too sensitive. And Sam Kerr's like, you're an old white bastard. And they're like, oh, the horror. Even Carl Sanderland didn't care. And if he was a character in GTA, he would be old white bastard. We're in this incredible time vortex. We'll remember this era forever. We'll remember this era forever where the media are angry at Sam Kerr for being drunkenly rude and then in the background we're just forgetting about hugely important issues like the government taking more money from Australian students than it does from the entire oil industry I'm talking about the government taking more hex more money from hex collecting more tax from hex than it does from the petroleum rent resources tax i.e all oil and gas in this country. I didn't think about that going to uni. You know, when I went to uni and I decided to study philosophy, I didn't think the government would be taking my money more than it did the canola oil that filled my young body. If one side of the culture war is anti-white cop and the other is pro-free speech, A white cop sending a Matilda to jail for being offended at their speech means the culture war has officially imploded. It's done. Carl Sandilands has gone on a rant about Sam Kerr. This is what I love. This is the distraction that we need. Right now, there's horrific things happening around the world that I should be paying attention to but I can have the sweetness and ease of mind that a radio jock and the captain of the national women's soccer team will go toe-to-toe and have an argument that will make Married at First Sight, Survivor, and The Biggest Loser look like penny stocks. That's the beauty of our time. We're living in a reality television era. We're in that reality television time where in real life people want reality television type entertainment. Nothing can be mundane. Things used to be melancholic. Things used to be kind of sad, but you couldn't say they were sad. They were like an artsy sad. You just had to believe in the sadness to move your hips in a certain way. And they said, that's a melancholic sadness. You're like, do I need antidepressants for that? No, you need an art gallery immediately. We need to find you a banana taped onto the wall and then label you hashtag melancholic. I'm using the word hashtag because that's what people said in the teens. In the 2010s, we used to say hashtag this, hashtag that, and it did F all. Hashtag stop big oil. Big oil turned to giant oil. I think the hashtag just gave them more fuel for the fire. Is that on the nose? When I was in Paris, after I caught a uh, uh, a jumbo jet to get there because I was going to sail, but I thought, no, all right, burn, baby. <laughs> I'm joking. I caught a massive jumbo jet to Paris and it was during the riots. There was no one really around. So I walked into the Louvre just to check it out. I'm making this seem like this is my average day. Like this is me going to a Chuka. I'd never been to Europe before. This is my first time. I've never been anywhere before and I'm in Paris and I'm trying to make it seem casual because it makes it sound more cool. You know, when I was at uni in first year, a lot of kids would be like, Ferg, I'm going on Kentucky over the summer. Where are you going? I'm like, I'm going to a big four holiday park. 
While you're drinking a sangrini, I will be jumping on a huge inflatable mattress that is actually quite comfortable until you get over the age of 12. And then it's inherently uncomfortable because of the adult gaze looking at you and going, you better get away from my five-year-old son. And you're like, okay, I've, I've aged out of the giant pillow on a big four holiday park. But I was in Paris and the riots were going on. So there was no one around. And I went into the Louvre and my hair was unkept. I hadn't shaved my face. A dude in his mid twenties. I think I had a Uniqlo top on. I looked like I was there to just stop oil. I had my hands behind my back the whole time. The security guards were so on me. I was like looking at the Mona Lisa and she was kind of looking at me, but also looking at all sides of the room. I'm not sure if any art critics have picked up on that, but I was trying to make eye contact with that beautiful Mona, that beautiful Lisa, but she was looking everywhere. I'm like, give me some eye contact. I yelled that at the penny. I said, give me some eye contact. Looking back, maybe they didn't think I was there to just stop oil. Maybe they thought I was mid psychosis and I was going to visit the Mona Lisa to punch it in the face before I protested the price of bread. That's from 1789, the French Revolution. But you know what I'm saying? I was in Paris with a dream and I know the feeling of what it's like to just stop oil. And I also could see the security guard's point of view where he wanted to just stop my stopping of the oil. Like I can see both sides, you know, like I can see the people protesting on the bridge, but then I know I will be a person in the car on a bridge whose wife is pregnant. Like that's just my life. I will be in that scenario. And I'll be like, guys, I love the climate, but please. All right. My sweet baby girl needs to get over the West gate because a baby, a little Neil is incoming. So it's important to see both sides of everything because then you can have empathy for that situation and you can make informed decisions. Sometimes it's even more fun to put yourself in their shoes. You're like, what are they thinking? We did that with Bob Catter last week, who I'm still going to see. We have a Bob Catter update every week. I'm seeing Bob Catter in camp, but that's happening, baby. We're working on it. All right, working on a date. He's so press heavy. He's always in the media. Yesterday he was in the media because he yelled at a Nationals MP while he's trying to present Senate legislation on a inquiry into the supermarket duopoly. So he's a very busy Man, I missed a voicemail from Bob Catter the other day. That's the scariest. I was on stage. I got off and said, Miss Call Bob Catter. I said, I can't be living this life. I can't be doing Comedy Untamed on a Thursday and my phone vibrates and I'm getting heckled by a British chick and then in my pocket is the longest standing politician in this country. At some point, something has to give. Maybe that's why I have CBD oil, just to take the sting. Just to take the sting off the live. Off the live. I don't say the life. Off the live. Trying to take the sting off the live. A little vice. A little sweet, sweet vice. That sweet, sweet, (laughs) sweet, sweet, tasty, tasty CBD oil. Kyle Sanderlands has weighed in on Matilda's captain Sam Kerr's court battle as she fights a charge of racially harassing a police officer in the UK. We all saw that title and we thought, holy We were confused. We were confused at first because we're like, okay, Sam Kerr is of Indian descent. I wonder what she said. And we all thought the worst. Were you thinking that word? I was thinking that. Everyone was thinking that word. When we first heard Sam Kerr had racially vilified a police officer, we were all thinking that word. We were all thinking Sam Kerr had said that word. There were people asking for her to stand down. There was a there was a bit of gravitas in the media and a bit of grandiosity about what she'd said, and the media loves a fall from grace. The media loves a fallen star. And then it came out that she called the cop an old white bastard, and we went, what? What? Some of us put German accents on. We're like, What? What are you talking about? (laughs) That's how confused we were. That's how confused we were. We're like, what are you talking? Like, nobody cared. Nobody, this is, something's happening in the culture where people getting less offended. I talked about being on a train and two kids are playing I Spy on the train, except instead of listing objects, they're roasting the passengers' physical attributes. No one was getting offended because we're in a post-offended society. I think we're transcending to it. I think the pendulum has swung back. As soon as someone says the pendulum, I start getting eerie. You know what I mean? I'm like, does anybody use that phrase in real time? The pendulum's swinging back, baby. Yeah, but then won't it swing back, back, back? You know what I mean? Like it'll, the pendulum keeps on going. They're like, yeah, but we're not scared about that backswing. We're all for the force. Scared of for- <laughs> all right. Will we edit that out? Maybe not. I tried to say four spin and yes, I said something that probably has demonetized us. So now we're here. Now the 
Now the good part of the podcast. <laughs> Why did I say that? How did I say that? How? As revealed by Daily Mail, Kerr 30 is preparing to face a four-day trial in February next year after she allegedly called a police officer a stupid white bastard. It sounds like we're in a Les Miserables. You stupid white bastard. Doesn't it sound so old-timey? You white bastard, you. Sounds very old-timey. Okay. Called a police officer. Oh, gives us some options. So Sam Kerr allegedly called a police officer a stupid white bastard, stupid white PC, or stupid white cop. Stupid white PC. What is P... I, when I was younger, I had like a Windows 98 PC that was white. That would be an amazing defense, guys. I didn't call him a white police officer. I called him a white PC, okay? Because he was slow, and when I dialed him up, he made a lot of noise, but he didn't deliver. Did I just write the greatest Windows 98 PC joke in real time ever? By God, I told you we're getting to the thick of the pod. Despite his former feud with Kerr. What? Sanderlands had a feud with Kerr. <laughs> I love that in every Carl Sanderlands article. It's like, despite his former feud. <laughs> he's like French in the goddamn 18th century. He's just going to war with everybody. He is our Napoleon. He's going to wars with everybody. But aren't I... Don't I need to back off the... I mean, I do have three favourites, but you know what I mean? It's like how the French love the English. I've got a few favourites in there, you know? A few favourites who I love. Go and for Sanderland's jump to the defence of the football star during Tuesday's Kyle and Jackie O radio show, insisting that calling someone a stupid white bastard didn't warrant a criminal conviction. It's not even a big deal. She calls some guy... Why does he speak like Tarzan? She calls some guy white bastard. Who care? The 52-year-old shock jock ranted. If you're feeling bad about your life, just remember that dude. That sentence comes from a dude making $20 million a year. Let that sink in for you, bad boy. That's going to turn you Bolshevik. Don't turn Bolshevik on me. Don't do it. White bastards don't care about that. That's for the other races to worry about, he added, before newsreader Brooklyn Ross promptly changed the topic. Yeah, let's change the topic before Carl Sanderlands starts doing the philosophy of race. What a lecture. Can you imagine rocking up to that in first year? I'm pretty sure it's O week now. I'm seeing a lot of first years around. We should get the first years just as a social experiment. What happens if you get 18-year-old uni students attending a lecture with Carl Sanderlands presenting the philosophy of race. What happens? Do people malfunction? Do people start to combogulate? That's not a word, but we're here. Sanderlands. <laughs> Sanderlands' previous feud. Why did he have a feud? Why? After viewing the footage, Sanderlands claimed on air that the athlete had failed to pay enough attention to the fans. All right. If there's 10-year-old girls at the airport waving a flag, wanting a photo when you arrive, how about just stopping for three people? There's not 300 there, Sanderlands remarked. This is a dude who's probably king hit some of his fans. And put a smile on your face every now and then. Little girls coming to meet you, it wouldn't kill you to crack a smile, he scoffed. I've never seen this man smile properly in my life. When he does, it's like a Persian cat. It's like, a, it's like the cat in Alice in Wonderland. You're like, oh, what's he plotting? Something is happening. If I'm ever on the Carl Sanderland show, you'll hear it in my voice. I'm like, oh, I've realized too late. I've realized too late. They've got photos of me coming out of the shower and they're going to show me them in real time and ask why I was dancing to Priscilla, Queen of the Desert as I came out of the shower naked. They're going to, I'm gonna, you're hearing the voice. I'll be like, oh, okay, he's doing the, he's doing the cat smile. I've cooked this. I have cooked this. Oh, now the article's just going more into the feud. So the feud started because Sam Kerr wasn't smiling enough to fans. Something that Carl Sanderlands definitely does a lot. I'd actually feel weird if Carl Sanderlands is walking towards me smiling. Again, it's that per sometimes, like when Sam Kerr smiles, I feel like, okay, this could be a good thing. You know, maybe I'm getting a free soccer ball. But if Carl Sanderlands is walking towards me smiling, I'm like, I'm going to get squished. There's going to be like a, it's going to be like an ad for Hyundai, like the Hyundai sponsoring Kiss FM and a car lands on me and I'm, I'm dem demise. And Carl Sanderlands steps in and goes, we're going to give one lucky car to whoever can claim this money. And I'm like, oh, I'm in heaven floating. Woo. Where's my jersey? What? Because I shit can Sam at the airport for not smiling. I get nothing. A furious Kyle ass on air. <laughs> 
That's so funny. So then Sam Kerr still sent a jersey to Carl Sanderlands. Wow. I respect Carl Sanderland's ability to piss people off. You know, like whenever he's trending, like I don't get annoyed by Carl Sanderland. I find him fascinating. Like as a socio-cultural figure, I find him inherently interesting. I'm like, what's he up to? What is he up to? It comes after Chelsea striker Kerr appeared in London, accused of using an insulting, threatening or abusive word to cause harm or distress to the police officer. We haven't spoken about the police officer. Let's investigate this dude. Because think about if you're a police officer, like we've all walked down Chapel Street and just someone on the beat, you get a lot of insults. Just being a cop on the beat, you're going to get a lot of insults, baby. I've been down Chapel Street and I heard like people say heinous things to cops. We just like, the cops just walking down the street. Do you have to be that mean to a cop, you know? Especially when it's the, the private school kids and they're like, a cab, you're like, you've never met a cop in your life. <laughs> Why? Are you, if like, let's be honest, if cops didn't exist, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, your parents wouldn't have that money, baby, because the Grims would come and get it from you. Okay. You're calling triple zero and telling them to fire as soon as your wine cellar is raided. So let's not pretend that you want to say a cab in reality, you know, in reality, the cop is an interesting figure that we have not examined. Because if you think about that cop, if you think about what that cop is going through, that cop has probably an idea of these culture wars. Like he's probably like, hey, there's a double standard here. A famous person has just called me an old white bastard. Why don't I use a racism law against them? This cop has to be semi-aware of this meta thing. You know what I mean? It's like in Western Australia when they passed the anti-vilification laws and the first person to use it was a white chick who used it against an indigenous lady who called the older white lady a white slaw. You know what I'm saying? A white sluzy. So... It's interesting. I think some people are aware of these laws and they go, oh, baby. Oh, you want to criminalize speech? Here we go. Which, as George Orwell said, is one of the riskiest things about criminalizing speech is that it can come back to hurt you. Okay. And speech in real time does hurt you. Like, all right, this is, this is, I'm getting bullied. You know, I'm getting taken down. But if you criminalize a speech, it's so difficult. You know, but then you're like, yeah, but you don't want someone being harassed based on something they can't change. So it's like, well, can you, ma- you know, it's so. Speech in law and philosophy was one of the most interesting things I studied because I'm like, yeah, there you should outlaw speech. And then you're like, yeah, but what happens? Who gets to decide who outlaws it? And you're like, oh, sh-. <laughs> like the counter argument to it. You're like, oh, no, you are right. Because then if a government comes in, it's like, Fur, you're no longer allowed to say the word comedy. I'm like, but I love saying the word comedy. Like, yeah, if you say it, you go to jail. I'd be like, oh, man. All right. This sucks. You know, this does suck and like that's the thing most things democratically they suck it's like you know it's like having an anti-free speech law it sucks but then having free speech also sucks it's like why can't we just sit in the suck and try and find the thing that sucks the less the thing that has the less damage overall to society the thing that has the most promise Maybe I'm talking about a utilitarian scenario, a trolley problem here where you turn the trolley and you save the one. You save the one over, no, you save the five over the one. Did I just say, (laughs) you you guys know what I'm saying. You're on my train of thought. I can feel the connection here deep within us. Or what I'm trying to say is that everything sucks, okay? But if you can find something that sucks the less, that'll be good. It's like house prices right now. It's like, it sucks, you know, like you probably won't be able to afford a house. Maybe you inherit a house though. A lot of people don't speak about that. I think that's why house prices stay up because everyone has a sniff of a house. Everybody is like three deaths happening away from inheriting a property they don't deserve. Truly. If you're listening to this, everybody is like four or five deaths away from it. It's like kind of like the the property market in Australia is like the royal family. Like how long till it's my turn? How long do I get to go? That's what it feels like in Australia. Like how long do it bestows on me the crown of property? Guys, come and see the live shows. I'm at the Canberra Comedy Festival, March 22. Then I'm in Melbourne, April 3 till April 23, I believe. Then Sydney, May 8, Brisbane, June 1. It's going to be one hell of a time. My name's Fergus Neal, and this is the Ferg Neal Show podcast.